next is the final question, question seven from section B of paper three. And this is the year 2019. It says the diagram in figure 7.1 shows an apparatus that can be used to investigate the relationship between the volume of a gas and the pressure exerted on it. Okay, so if you have a look at the diagram, you see we have an air pump that's connected to a pressure gauge, which allows us to read the pressure. When the air is pumped, it pushes down on this oil in this reservoir. And the oil then forces air in the tube to take up a smaller volume. When the pressure is released, then the oil will go back down and the air can spread back out. Okay, so the first question we're asked and before you um, get confused, remember that pressure and volume immediately you should be thinking right now which law. You might not be familiar with this experimental setup, but this is pressure and volume. So we're talking about Boyle's law. Okay. All right. So the first two questions were asked. Explain in terms of its molecules. So what happens to its molecules? How the trapped air exerts a pressure on the gas on the glass tube. All right. So in order for something to exert a pressure, then it needs to be exerting a force, so pushing on a surface. So that's what the air particles are doing. In order for them to exert a pressure, then we're going to say that the molecules, they spread out. So this is when the volume is allowed to increase. You have a greater volume, so the molecules will spread out. and they will push against the sides of the glass tube, okay? So in all honesty, this question has a little bit of ambiguity to me, I think. Um, so it says how the trapped air exerts a pressure on the glass tube. Um, they would spread out, to exert a pressure. However, you may also be thinking, well, when the molecules spread out, then the pressure of that gas would decrease. So um, you might want to say when the liquid, the oil, pushes up, then the volume gets smaller and the pressure increases. So is it exerting uh, pressure on the glass tube in that sense. Um, I would say you could phrase it like that as well. So I think this is a pretty safe answer. Okay, I think we're looking for molecules spread out and push against the sides of the glass tube. Okay. Um, the second question, explain in terms of its molecules why the pressure of a fixed volume of gas increases with temperature. Okay, well, we know that temperature is directly related to kinetic energy. So the greater the kinetic energy, or the greater the temperature, rather, it corresponds to a greater kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy that an object's object has due to its motion. So if it's moving faster, then there are more collisions with other particles and with the sides of the container. So that results in an increase in pressure in that area. Okay, so that's the first part of the question. Then the question goes on now, we're switching gears. Note the access now about Charles' law, not Boyle's law anymore. Okay, so forget the diagram. Part A is only dealing with that first diagram. So the diagram only corresponds to A1 and 2. So part B now is talking about Charles' law. Charles' law investigates relationship between the volume of a gas and its absolute temperature. Remember, absolute temperature just means temperature in kelvins. 
Okay, keeping mass and pressure constant. Part one says to describe an experiment you would perform to investigate this relationship. A label diagram of the apparatus must be drawn and is worth two marks. Okay, so there are four marks total. Two is for your explanation, but the other two are for your diagram. So the diagram that you need to know is this one right here, that you can label this diagram correctly. So what we have is a beaker that contains some water. And inside the beaker, we have what's called the capillary tube. Okay, that's this part here with this little plug of concentrated sulfuric acid that kind of acts like the oil in the previous diagram to seal it off, to trap the air so that we can see when the air expands and contracts. Okay, and then next to that, we have a ruler so we can measure the length of the column of air that corresponds to the volume. So the capillary tube is cylindrical, so it's it's round. And if we take the cross-sectional area of that and multiply it by the length, then we get the volume. So we are te technically measuring the length, but we can calculate the volume once we know the area of the tube, the cross-sectional area. Okay, and then of course we have the gas being tested. That's the air in here. Okay, so this is the air down here that's being tested. Okay, this part is open. This part is closed. So there's air trapped in here between the concentrated sulfuric acid and the closed end, and this part is just open. Okay, so we're watching how this column changes. That's how that works. And then, of course, this is our thermometer. This is not labeled here, but it really should be. So make sure you label that. So you get two points for this diagram. If you want to draw a little flame, little Bunsen burner at the bottom here, you can do that as well. Or you can just label um, some arrows and say that's where the heat is coming from. Then we have our simple explanation. So we'd set up the apparatus as shown in our diagram. Then we would heat the water gently when the capillary tube is in the beaker. And finally, we would measure volume of the air column by measuring the length of the air and multiplying it by the cross-sectional area and the temperature of the water. Okay, so those would be the two readings that we would be taking. Read the thermometer, read the volume or the length of the air column in the capillary tube. Okay, so very, very simplified version. Um, it's only four points. When you're writing an exam, you want to be very concise. So all of um, the extras that you would put, if you were doing you know, a lab report like gather materials, be safe, do this. Don't put all of that on the exam. Okay, very, very straight to the point. Um, just say what action you need to take in order to get it started. So heat the water and then what measurements you need to take. So that's about it. Um, that is for part B, I. So the second part of the question, part B, Two says sketch a graph of volume versus absolute temperature that you would expect to see from this investigation. All right, so I drew that again on another slide. So this is what that looks like. Now what I have in red is what you need to label on your graph, but these other two parts are just what you need to know because they might come up, even though it's not coming up in this particular question, I've seen questions where they ask, what is the y-intercept and what's the x-intercept? So when they say sketch, by the way, you're not doing this on the graph paper, okay? You are just drawing this on your answer paper. You just use a ruler and you just sketch it. You don't need to put any numbers in there, only the important numbers. Um, so you draw volume on the y-axis, temperature on the x-axis, and then you're going to mark these two points. Um, so it said you would expect to see, um, basically all we're looking for is that you draw a straight line. Okay? And you can extrapolate where absolute 
zero would be. And what you're showing here is that the relationship between volume and temperature is directly proportional. That's what we're looking for. Linear graph, straight line, which is the next question. So that's the graph that you should draw on your diagram. You don't need to write Y intercept and X intercept. You just need to write volume, temperature. Um, this is zero degrees, negative 27, negative 273. Um, sorry, that should say Kelvin. Kelvin, not degrees. Kelvin. Okay. Going back to the question, so that's part one, part two. What does this graph show about the relationship between the volume of a gas and temperature? It shows us that it's directly proportional, okay? That's what we're looking for, not that it's linear. A straight line graph is how we know it's directly proportional because if you're plotting two quantities and they're increasing at the same rate, then you get a straight line. And that tells us the relationship between them, directly proportional. All right, next part of the question. Now we have to plot a graph. We're given a table of values from the hypothetical, hypothetical experiment we just carried out. And we're going to use that table of values to draw a graph of volume against pressure. Okay, so now we're back to the experiment in part A. So this is pressure and volume. So we're going to be drawing a Boyle's Law graph. So we should not expect to see a straight line because the relationship between pressure and volume are inversely proportional. So your graph is going to look like this. So if you have not done so already, pause the video right now and go and plot your graph. Plotted your graph? Okay. It should look like Remember your title, remember your scale, remember to mark your divisions equally, remember to label each axis with the quantity name and the unit name, you get points for that, okay? Once you've done that, now we can go ahead and use our graph to answer the questions. So only one question they ask us about the graph. So we're to use our graph to find the volume of air when the pressure is 35 newtons per square meter. All right, so we need to go to the pressure that's on the x-axis here, and we're gonna go up from 35. We're gonna touch the graph. And then we're going to come all the way over and see at which volume will the gas be at this point. And the answer is 40. Okay, so plus or minus 40 cubic centimeters. All right. And the last question, all right, the combined gas equation. If you have not heard of that, that's exactly what it says. It is all three gas law equations put together. And it's P1, V1 over T1 equals P2, V2 over T2. All right, so if I'm not mistaken, this is given to you. Yeah, it's gonna be given to you in the list of formulas, but only for this paper, for paper three. So it's there on the paper, so you don't have to remember it, but it's always good if you remember it because it takes you some time. All right, so the first thing we want to do is write out 
all of the information that were given in the question. So it's a good idea to maybe pause right now and write out everything you know, P1, T1, V1, everything, and then come back and see if you got them all correct. Okay, so this is what we should have. So we're told that the pressure initially is 200 kilopascals. So that's P1, and I'm going to write it in pascals. So that would be 200,000 pascals. Then we're told that the temperature initially is 25 degrees Celsius. However, we have to remember that our temperature always has to be converted to Kelvin. And to do that, to go from Celsius to Kelvin, we must add 273. So we're going to go ahead and do that. So temperature 1 is 25 plus 273, and whatever that value is, which is 298 Kelvin, that's our T1. Okay, so we got P1, T1, then we're told that the volume of the gas in the balloon is 5 cubic meters, so that's our V1, it's 5. Then we're told that V2 is our target variable. So calculate the volume of the gas. So this would be the second volume after some things are changed. So V2 is what we're trying to find. And we also know that the temperature, the new temperature is going to be 15 degrees Celsius. And we're going to go ahead and change that to Kelvin. So that's 15 plus 273, which is going to give us 288 Kelvin. And then the last piece of information we're told is P1, P2, sorry, which is 80 kilopascals. Anytime you see kilo, you just replace the K with three zeros, and that's your value in Pascals, okay? So this is all our information there. Make sure you got them all correct. So P1, 200,000 Pascals, T1, 298 Kelvin, V1, five cubic meters, V2, that's our target variable, T2, 288 Kelvin, and P2, 80,000 Pascals. All right, so now the next thing we need to do is manipulate our equation so that V2 is the subject of the formula. And then we'll just substitute our values and simplify. So the first thing I want to do is cross multiply. So my equation is going to become P1, V1 multiplied by T2 is equal to P2, V2, multiplied by T1. Once I have that nice in just one line, I'm going to identify my target variable, which is V1, and then all I need to do now is divide by these two variables that are next to my target variable, and then I will have my equation in the form that I need it. So this becomes V2 is equal to P1, V1, T2, and all those are being multiplied, so that's P1 times V1 times T2 divided by, you put brackets around them so you know they all go together, divided by P2, T1. And again, those two are also being multiplied. Okay, so we got that done. All this for just three points. I know, right? But that's fine. You got to get all the points. You got to do it logically, systematically, and make sure that you don't lose points for anything. Okay, so now it's time to substitute. So let's plug in our values. P1, so that's 200,000 pascals multiplied by V1, which is 5 multiplied by T2, 
which we've worked out, converted that to Kelvin, and so that's 288. Note that it's T2 on top, okay? In this equation, T2 at the top and T1 at the bottom. Put a bracket around those. Big division bar. Let's continue. P2 at the bottom, that's 280. 80,000 80, multiplied by 298. And now, last thing we need to do is just simplify. I'm going to add an extra little step here just to simplify the top and the bottom so you can make sure that you're on the right track. So when we multiply 200,000 by 5 by 288, we get 200. 88 million, lots of zeros, okay? All right, and then divide 80,000 by 298, which is our T1, and we get 2, 3, 8, 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, okay? And if we simplify that, so we don't even need to go ahead and plug all of that in our calculator. We can just cross out those zeros and we can plug in 288. Um, thousand divided by 23,840 and when we work that out we get I'll give you a minute work it out pause the video all right if you got 12.08 cubic meters then you are absolutely correct and we are done with this paper. Awesome job. You're on your way to your A or B on the extended BGCSE. Keep practicing and I will see you in the next video.